So I'm delighted to be here to um, help moderate this panel. We have two very distinguished um, participants. And the format we'll, ha we'll have is that they will uh, make individual presentations around 20 minutes. And after that, we will sit down there and take questions uh, from the audience. So please uh, feel free to ask anything that comes to your mind, okay? So let me, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce the, the first speaker. Uh, that is Maria Cristina Villalobos. Dr. Cristina Villalobos holds the President's Endowed Professorship at the University of Texas Pan American, where she is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and is founding director of the Center of Excellence in STEM Education. She was recently appointed Ad Interim Director of the School of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Her research interests lie in optimization and in STEM. Now STEM means science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So I assume a high school student doesn't know these acronyms, you know. You'll get to know these acronyms eventually. Uh, where was I? She has received teaching and mentoring awards, such as the 2013 University of Texas System Regents Outstanding Teaching Award, and the 2013 SACNAS Distinguished Undergraduate Institution Mentor Award, along with a 2012 HENAC Luminary Award for her leadership service in STEM. She serves on various mathematics professional committees and is active in mentoring students to obtain graduate degrees and is also involved with the university's NSF advanced grant to retain women in STEM. Dr. Villalobos was recently appointed to a three-year term to serve on the board of directors for the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, SACNAS. She is a Tejana who was raised in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and received her undergraduate degree in mathematics from the University of Texas, Austin, and her PhD in applied mathematics in the year 2000 from Rice University. Let us please welcome Maria Cristina Villalobos. All right, well thank you for um, having me here today. And um, can the high school students just raise their hands real quick? Okay, great. All right, and thank you, you know, welcome. So, um, and I say welcome because this is our first um, Latinos in Mathematical Sciences conference. We've never had one before. And so it's a pleasure that you all are here so that, um, you know, we can talk to you and you can learn about, uh, you know, the fields that we work in mathematics. And, um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is titled Taking the Initiative. And I'm very passionate about, um, you know, students and just individuals taking the initiative. Um, and so I'm going to describe some of my uh, background my upbringing, and then uh, my career path, right? Now, my upbringing is probably similar to some of y'all's, and I know some of my colleagues here who are now faculty um, at, in academia or working in industry have also similar backgrounds as myself, and so the reason I'm showing this is I just want you to, you know, that we're all you know, very much similar to each other in terms of the background, right? And, um, and so, you know, if some of us can do it, I hope that you can, um, you know, learn that you can, you know, also do it with, um, you know, with work and, and, and effort. Okay. All right, so I'll just speak a little bit about my, um, my parents' background. So my parents were born and raised in Mexico, and actually it's a small town. It's at Hualahuises, Nuevo Leon. It is close to Linares, and uh, about an hour and a half south of Monterrey. So, so they were, uh, you know, raised in northern Mexico. Uh, my my uh, my parents actually only my my dad um, only uh, uh, achieved uh, the, uh, to go to school to the third grade, right? And so my dad was born in 1925, so he's about to turn 90 in November. And uh, and my my parents you know met each other. They are 21 years apart in age difference, right? So I'm just trying to give you an idea of, of you know certain instances here. So my father had to. Um, drop out of the third grade in Mexico to help his, uh, his family in Mexico, right? So he comes from a large family, and, uh, and at that time it was you know, about 1930, 1938, something like that, and so he needed to um, you know, uh, exit school so that he could uh, get a job. And then my mother did finish high school in Mexico, right? But both of my parents didn't go beyond um, uh, high school, or in, in the case of my father, third grade, to get a college education, right? And so, but they, you know, but they both understood that college was very important, right? So anyway, they, they met in Wallowises, um, they got married, and then they settled in Texas, right? And so, um, 
my my siblings and I were both were all born in the Rio Grande Valley, actually in McAllen, and I'll show you a picture in a, in a minute. And um, and I'm the oldest of three, so it's my myself and then my sister who's a year and a few days younger than me, and then I've got a brother who's 12 years younger, right? And uh, and so you know things are you know going well, and um, and and so and and another thing real quick. Um, we also come from, uh, I, well, actually, I, I come from a low-income family. And um, as I was growing up, I didn't understand that we, that we were a low-income family until I went to college. And I remember talking to Richard Tapia about this. I said, and it wasn't until I went to UT Austin that I realized I was low-income. I thought I was middle class all this time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because we had a house, and, and, and my parents paid for the house. And because they were always into, um, you know, we've got to, you know, we don't want to be in debt. And to this day, they're not in debt, and I'm not in debt. And uh, so they always taught us to um, live within your means, right? So we bought, you know, my parents bought a house. They paid it off. Um, we, you know, we had to borrow money from neighbors sometimes. And I remember it used to be like $20. And, you know, we got to borrow $20 from, you know, from the Senor este, uh, Torres. And, um, and so, you know, I remember thinking $20. And this was in the 1970s. And, and so I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's, that's not a lot of money. But at the same time, it is, it is quite a bit because my parents had to use that to um, purchase gas so that my mom could go to work. Right, and, um, and so it wasn't until, like I said, when I went to college that I realized I was low income. And, um, and so, you know, so that happened, but you know, things were fine. You know, we survived, everything was okay. Um, and then another thing is, you know, so both of my parents worked, and, um, and so I ended up going to Head Start. So how many of you are aware of Head Start? Yeah, good, okay, so yeah, it's a program that Lyndon, Pre President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, established, you know, several years ago. So anyway, I was a product of Head Start. My parents worked, and um, and so I used to pick up my sister, you know, when I was in first grade from Head Start and, and so forth. We'd walk to school together, um, and then I was also in bilingual programs. So Spanish was my first language, and I was in bilingual programs, you know, from kindergarten through first and second grade. And then I remember being in third grade and having a, a Caucasian teacher who only spoke English, and I thought, oh geez, I've got to formulate my English sentences before I go up and ask her a question, right? And so this was something that I stressed about, um, you know, but I eventually got over that. Um, and then through um, public schools, I, uh, during the summers actually, um, you know, during the, when I was in during the summers, I'd stay at home. And my brother was, when I was 12, my brother was born, so I used to take care of my brother during the summers. Um, and so, you know, I think about my, my kids now who are 10 and 12, and I look at my son who's 12 and I'm wondering, there's no way I could you know, leave a child with my son to do, you know, at that age with a baby. But my mother did this. And so I grew up quite quickly uh, being the oldest, right? And I had a lot of response. You know, my mom put a lot of responsibilities on me. And so I realized that you know, I had to be the one to do certain things at the house and to help my parents out because they didn't know English. Um, so anyway, then through um, high school, you know, I mentioned here the Texas Pre-Freshman Engineering Program. And I, I wanted to mention this because as a high school student, um, I was also involved in summer programs, right? So this was like, I think at the end of 10th grade and at the end of 11th grade. And, um, and I realized, you know, there was this program at the university, at our local university, uh, for students who were possibly interested in going into engineering. And so those two summers I spent um, in tech prep. So I was always kind of, you know, doing something, right? And, uh, you know, trying to get ahead. And then I was also in uh, University Interscholastic League, UIL. So that's a big thing in Texas where you compete district-wide, uh, region-wide, and statewide. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and so, yeah, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. But in terms of the summer job, um, I mentioned here, you know, the shoe store and a cashier. So as I was growing up, um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to, um, what I wanted to do in life. And uh, at first, I wanted to become a secretary, and I thought, this is what I want to do. Um, and then I wasn't sure if I, if I wanted to go to college. So when I was in high school, I thought, I'm going to take a job at a Payless shoe store, right, and see if I like a job like that. And so I did it. Uh, you know, it was probably for a month, and I realized I did not like this. So you know, I got out of that. And then uh, while I was in text prep one summer, I took a job as a cashier at a grocery store. And, um, and we had those machines back then where, you know, the manual ones where you had to memorize the prices for everything, for, you know, the amount of uh, uh, price, uh, pa price per pound of bananas and all these other things. So you had to memorize quite a lot. Then, you know, now you just scan things. 
But um, so I took a job like that, and I thought, no, I, I just don't like this. So then that's when I realized maybe I should go to college. So I was really experimenting because I wanted to make sure that, you know, if I was going to go to college, I wanted to make sure that that was what I wanted to do, right? And I'd have to turn back and say, what if, you know, I had done something else? Oops. Okay, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. So, but let me just tell you where I was raised. So here's, uh, you know, the state of Texas. And um, so, let's see. Uh, okay, so here's Texas, and uh, this lower part is where um, I was raised, right? And so that's this part here. Here's the Gulf of Mexico, and then Mexico, right? So I was born in Donna, which is a small town, about 10,000, and raised, sorry, I was born in McAllen, and I was raised in Donna, which is about right there. Now, the university that I work at now is UT Pan American. So we're in Edinburgh, Texas, which is just next door to uh, McAllen, right? So whenever you hear of the Rio Grande Valley, it's basically from Brownsville, right, this area, all the way to Rio Grande City, all right? And then you've got um, Corpus Christi, and then Houston is somewhere up here, San Antonio is four hours north of us, and so forth. So we're very, you know, very close to the border. And then uh, Monterrey is over on this side, and my parents, as I mentioned, were, uh, were raised close to Monterrey, right? So, so things are pretty close. Okay, so let me just, you know, mention a few things about my mom, because I, I, I realized my mom played, you know, such an important role in, in my education. So my mom stressed, um, you know, always to be honest in your work, right? So my parents worked in canning factories, so they canned tomatoes, um, peas, and then my mom also worked as a custodian in a Head Start program, and this was, you know, way after my, my sister and I had left Head Start. And uh, so she was a custodian, but she always told us to, um, you know, be honest in your work, right? And be proud of what you do. Never be ashamed of whatever work you hold, um, you know, whether it's at the university level, administrative, or whether, you know, it's a custodial work. So she, she, you know, really stressed that quite a lot. Just be proud and be proud because you're doing an honest work, right? She also stressed to do good grades in school, so, uh, or to achieve good grades in school. So although my parents didn't go to college, um, and again, my mom was the only one who finished high school, um, she knew the importance of good grades. And the importance of pursuing, you know, going beyond high school, although I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at the time. And then another thing she taught me was um, to take the initiative and to seek opportunities. And most of the talk will be based on that bullet, uh, on taking the initiative, right? And, and I'll mention, you know, how I did that a little bit later. Um, and then she also mentioned, as a woman, um, and, I'm, and, and, I'm, and I stress this whenever I give talks to um, girls, you know, middle school, elementary girls, um, my mom mentioned quite a lot to, um, you know, have a job and a career, right? And so for my mother, um, she, you know, witnessed several relatives who had gone, you know, abused in the past by, you know, a husband or, or others. And, uh, and so my mom always told us, you've got to have a job. Should anything happen, you know, you can, you don't have to depend on somebody. You can leave if need be. So I clearly remember that. And, um, and so that was one thing that I, you know, I told myself, if I happen not to go to college, I know I have to get a job, right? And uh, so I just want to you know, just you know, mention that, and maybe it'll come up for a conversation later. Um, and so, as I mentioned previously, my early aspirations were to become a secretary. And, uh, and I thought, this is you know, all I, you know, really what I want to do. But then later, and it wasn't until I was in high school that I realized maybe I should become an archeologist. And I was, I loved studying dinosaurs, um, and so that's what I wanted to do, dig up dinosaur bones. Um, and so I thought maybe an archeologist, and then I thought, you know, they travel too much, and I really would like to have a family, and that's gonna be tough. So then I thought an architect, right? And so I kind of moved around, and you know, at one point I wanted to become a mathematics tutor, so I decided I would go to college to become a math teacher, right? And then things changed along, I mean, I'm, I'm still in a similar career, uh, you know, beyond being a, a K-12 teacher. Okay, so here's my um, college education. So, you know, I mentioned I was the first in my family, uh, the oldest of the siblings, and I'm also a first-generation college student. And I know, you know many of you are also first-generation college students. And um, I, I, so being a first-generation college student, my parents did not want me to leave home, right? They said, there's a local university, why don't you go to that one, which is Pan American, but at the time it, it was called something else. Um, and I thought, you know, Mom, I, I went to UT Austin because I had competed there for um, a competition. And I, I like the campus, and it's a good school. And, you know, so my mom said, well, go talk to your godmother. 
and your godmother will, you know, help you decide. And I thought, my fate is, you know, here, you know, on my godmother. And, uh, you know, and she was an educator. So, I, you know, her two kids, uh, one of her uh, children was a medical doctor, and the other one was in, uh, you know, an, an administrator, a counselor. And I thought, well, maybe things are fine. You know, I shouldn't be too scared. And so she said, yeah, you know, you teach a good school. And she just told me that. She never spoke to my mom. And I went back and I told my mom, yeah, my godmother says it's okay. All right, you can go, right? So it was kind of easy, but at the same time, what if it had gone the other way? Um, so anyway, so I left home. And, um, and then while I was at Austin, you know, um, of course, you know, I didn't have any money. So um, I had to rely on Pell Grants and loans also. So I took out a loan. Um, I also worked as a work study student and a mathematics grader for the department. Right, so I was living, uh, you know, I had a roommate, and, um, and, and so you have to, you know, share costs and, and, and other expenses, right? But that's the type of work that I had, and then I was also a math tutor with the Hispanic Mother-Daughter Program, and then um, I attended some research programs, uh, as mentioned here, um, you know, over the summers while I was a college student, right? And then finally, um, I got my PhD in, in Applied Mathematics at Rice University. Okay, so here's the, really the slide I want to focus on, taking the initiative. And so, as I mentioned, when I give talks to students, um, I focus on, you know, getting the idea across to students to take the initiative. Because um, it's very difficult for somebody to always, let's say, or the majority of the time, um, reach out to you, right? There's so many, when you go to college, there's so many students. Uh, when I was in, uh, at UT Austin, uh, there was, uh, Austin has a, popul a student population of about 50,000, right? And I was coming from Donna, that's 10,000, right? So my school was contained in, you know, my, my city, my town was contained inside UT Austin. Um, and so that was very difficult for me. And, uh, but along the way, you know, I had learned to take the initiative. My mom would always ask me, would tell me, how come you're not getting the scholarship? Why don't you go ask? Or how come you're not in honors classes? Right, because I was making good grades in high school, but I wasn't testing well enough to be into honors classes. And so I remember going to the counselor and I said, look, I'm making all the grades. Some of my peers are not even studying and um, you know, getting C's while I'm getting A's. And, um, and so I remember talking to the counselor. She said, you know, you should be in honors classes. So my last two years, I was taking honors classes here and there because I needed a certain amount of honors classes to graduate with honors. And so that taught me that if I spoke up and I found, um, you know, and I took the initiative to ask that maybe things could come my way, right? And so, um, and so I applied that quite a lot. Um, then when I was in high school, I, I, uh, I was in the Inter Universe Interscholastic League, or UIL. And as I mentioned, it's a state competition. Um, I was in spelling. I've always been good in spelling, and I placed in district, got awards, things were fine. But I couldn't get to the state level. And, um, and then I, I remember we were in a competition, uh, you know, I was in spelling, and another group from my high school was in typing, right? So, so back then, uh, you know, we called it typing, and I think now they call it keyboarding or something like that, right? Okay. So we used to take typing classes, and uh, this was in eighth grade, and I was pretty good at typing. I typed really fast, and uh, so I happened to go to this competition with the, uh, the student typists who were competing in typing also. And uh, their um, sponsor had said uh, they couldn't get to state. They go, well, you know, we're very close to getting to state. We just can't get it. And so I asked, well, how many words can you type? And, you know, 50 words a minute with no errors. And I said, my goodness, I can do much better than that. You know, and so, and it was an opportunity to get a scholarship. That, that's, that was the whole reason I did it. And I thought, great, I can get a scholarship and I can go to college, right? And so I ended up taking, you know, enrolling in typing in high school for, you know, for a semester when I had already taken it in eighth grade, but I had to enroll in typing in order to compete. So there I am, you know, finishing everything early because I know how to type. Um, and, you know, and, and so what happens, um, uh, yeah, so anyway, I, 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 uh, I enroll in, in UIL typing, I make it to district, make it to regionals, and then eventually I end up um, getting second place in state. And so my school was, you know, really happy. My sponsor, I think, just retired as soon as somebody got state. And, uh, and so, you know, it was really exciting. And so I applied for a scholarship. I did not get the scholarship, right? And this was my whole idea. And I thought, oh, this was the reason I wanted to go to state, you know, get into typing. But anyway, I didn't get the scholarship. But it was good because I learned, you know, perseverance and discipline. Um, and then, as I mentioned, also, during the summers, I was involved in text prep. So it's a summer program. And, um, and I was always doing something in high school. 
uh, you know, whether involved in, in uh, student organizations. Uh, but in the summer, I just, you know, figured in order to prepare myself for college, I should, you know, go to these summer programs, and they were free, right? And, uh, and so we still have that program, textbook after, you know, 20 years, 20 years ago that it's starting, right? And then another thing that I recommend to students um, in high school is definitely, you know, take exciting classes, right? So that's another thing that you can do. It's at your school. And I mean, I remember, vividly remember classes like anatomy and physiology that I took in high school, marine biology, uh, you know, calculus one, so I had to mention a math course. Um, and so these were, you know, exciting classes. And, and I still remember that we dissected a cat and a shark at one point. I mean, this was neat, right? And right before lunch, it happened to be. And so, you know, you smelled fluorescent, uh, I forgot the uh, hydrochloric acid or something. And, um, but it was exciting, right? It was very exciting. And I still remember that. Um, and then again, taking the initiative, my first year, in, you know, when I went to UT Austin, um, that was a big culture shock for me because I came from the Valley uh, where about 90% of the population is Latino, right? I go to Austin and it's a big culture shock, right? I mean, I thought I was middle class and now I'm low, you know, low income and I had been low income all this time. Um, and so things were very different. Um, and so there were, you know, students from the Valley who also went to Austin. We met up at the dorms, we studied together. And then I found out about this Emerging Scholars Program, which had been established at UC Berkeley, right? And Aust UT Austin then carried it over there. So it was a program mainly for minority students, uh, you know, talented minority students uh, for Calculus One and Calculus Two. I had taken Calculus One in the fall semester. Things were great because I had taken Cal One in high school. So I aced the class, not a problem. But I learned about this and I, you know, from my friends and I thought, why am I not in this program? So I go ask and I said, look, I want to be in this program, maybe the spring semester, because my goal is to become a high school teacher and I want to make sure I'm really prepared, right, to teach calculus in high school and da da da. So, um, so I ask about it and I get enrolled in the spring semester for calculus too. And so that helped me get an A in the class because it's a very intensive, uh, you know, program. Um, it's, you know, you go to course, it's four hours a, sem uh, four hours a week, but then with the Emerging Scholars Program, you meet six hours outside of class. Right? So very intensive, and that helped me get the A. So there again, I took the initiative to ask, you know, why am I not in here? You know, get me in. Um, and then through my second and fifth years in college, um, I mentioned here I attended summer research programs. So when I was in college, I had very good uh, mentors. I had. Um, Dr. Efraim Armendariz, who used to be the chair of the mathematics department at UT Austin. And uh, he was Latino, actually Mexican-American, one of the few Latinos in the math department. And, uh, and I took a class with him, and he you know, advised me and others to uh, go to some summer research programs. And we went to UC Berkeley uh, two summers, and so that was exciting. And I know, uh, let me see, Herb. Yeah, can you raise your hand, Herb? Herb and uh, Ricardo. Yeah, so both of them I, I met when I was an undergraduate student at, you know, when I went to UC Berkeley for those summers, right? And so now I, you know, I guess we circle again. Um, and, and so the, the idea here, again, you take the initiative and you ask for opportunities, right? What is out there? And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a PhD. I just figured, you know, this is something I should do in the summer. And then I also went to Rice University for one summer, so the National Labs, right? So I went to these summer programs, just taking it step by step. And then I was at a conference at you know, Society for the Advancements of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science in Chicago. And, um, and I was, I think, a junior uh, as an undergrad. And so we were at this conference in Chicago. And myself and two other students from UT Austin attended the conference. And we decided to visit Purdue. And we said, look, we're considering going to graduate school. Uh, Purdue is about three hours away, I think it was. Yeah. And, um, and so we said, let's just rent a car and visit Purdue. So again, you take the initiative, right? So we rented a car, we visited Purdue. Uh, Dr. Banuelos, I don't think, was there at the moment. Yeah. But Dr. Brown was there, right? And so we, uh, who's African American. So we spoke to Dr. Brown, we met some other graduate students. And, um, and so we thought, oh, maybe we can do, you know, maybe we might consider going to graduate school. So again, another opportunity to take the initiative. And then uh, my last one was with uh, Dr. Richard Tapia, and this is where he was my, advi my PhD advisor for graduate school. Um, I was, you know, again, an undergraduate at UT Austin, and I had a friend who uh, had read an article about Richard Tapia. So if you don't know who he is, just Google him. Um, you know, you'll get several pages of information. Um, so he's one of the, you know, at the time, one of the few Mexican-American um, 
uh, professors, right, who was teaching at Rice. And Houston is, Rice is in Houston, and that's about three hours from Austin. So I had a friend who said, look, uh, I just read about this Mexican-American mathematician, and um, can we go, um, you know, should we go visit? And, and we said, well, sure, you know, why don't we call him up and, and make an appointment? And so we happened to go one, one Saturday. And um, we happened to go one Saturday to go visit him. And, uh, and, you know, so we spent one weekend with Richard Tapia. We had dinner with some mathematicians. And, and then I, I asked Richard Tapia about a summer program that he ran, and he said, come join us. So that's how I got introduced to Rice. And that's how I decided to go to, you know, graduate studies uh, at Rice. So again, a lot of this is just, um, you know, taking the initiative. Okay, and just real quick, because uh, I think I'm, I'm almost, I should be done already. I'm a faculty member at UT Pan American. Uh, my roles are, you know, I teach classes, I provide service to the community and to the, profession, to the mathematical profession. My research is in optimization and I've been working on these types of problems lately. Um, I'm also the director of the STEM, uh, Center in STEM Education. And then just recently I was appointed this interim director. But what I want you to notice there are the, uh, the numbers, right? So in the School of Mathematics we have 50 faculty, right, 5-0. And out of the 50 we have five women. So 10%, so that's very, very small, very small number, right? And then if you look at the Latinos, that's even smaller than that, right? And so for the students that are out there, um, you know, this conference is here for you basically to mentor you, to help guide you to the next step of a PhD. And, um, you know, and I hope you consider these numbers and, and speak to the rest of us that are here so that we can, you know, just provide you with advice, you know, just to ask frank questions, just be sincere and, um, you know, and just get you to that next level to get a, a college degree and, and hopefully, you know, consider getting the PhD. Okay, and just a few pictures here. I just wanted to put something personal. That's my family up there, my sister. You see, that's my sister, brother, myself, and my children there, my parents. And then these are some of the students that I work with, and Jorge is attending uh, this conference. And, uh, okay, and I think that's it. All right, thank you. So now it's a pleasure for me to introduce the uh, second panelist. Um, I've actually met Anna Marie a couple of times. Uh, she's at the University of Washington, which is very close to uh, UBC, uh, British Columbia, and uh, she has the um, pleasure of reviewing our Faculty of Science. So let me tell you about her. Professor Anna Marie Cause is the interim president of the University of Washington. Dr. Cause joined the University of Washington's faculty in 1986 and is a full professor with the departments of psychology and American ethnic studies with secondary appointments in gender, women and sexuality studies and the College of Education. She became interim president in March of 2015 after a successful tenure as the UW's provost and executive vice president. President Kause has held numerous leadership positions at the UW, including director of the UW Honors Program, chair of American Ethnic Studies, chair of psychology, executive vice provost, and dean of arts and sciences, and most recently as provost and executive vice president. Amongst the recognitions that she has earned through her career are the Dalmas Taylor Distinguished Contribution Award, the Luis Fernando Esteban Public Service Award, the James M. Jones Lifetime Achievement Award of the American Psychological Association, the Grace Hopper Exemplary Leadership Award, and the Distinguished Contribution Award from the Society for Community Research and Action. Now, I think the one she's most proud of was the one she, she was awarded in 1989 when she joined a list of notable faculty of being awarded the Distinguished Teaching Award, the highest honor the University of Washington gives faculty members for their work with students both within and outside the classroom. Please join me in welcoming Anna Marie Kaus. Thank you so much. Um, hi, it's wonderful and fabulous to be here and to see, you know, all these inspirational folks out here in the audience. Um, I'm not a mathematician. And so if I were to give my uh, talk a title, it would be more, it would be STEM for life. Because, you know, part of the point that I really want to make is that in this day and age, um, 
we can't function either as citizens without a good knowledge of STEM. How could you be on a jury and not understand something like DNA? Um, but also that STEM really undergirds a lot of careers and a lot of research like my area of psychology that's become very quantitative. So that it's not just about, although I think it's fabulous to become a faculty member in math or in the STEM areas, that this is really about being a functioning um, member of society. So I'm gonna come at this a little bit differently and I'll talk a little bit about my life at the end, but I wanna begin by just talking about some of the obstacles. You know, why are there so few women and so few underrepresented minorities in the STEM areas? And, and I wanna focus, it's not just STEM in general, but where you particularly see the underrepresentation is in the quantitative areas, so math, applied math, statistics, and in the physical sciences. So, for example, physics. Things are going a lot better in the life sciences. So I'm gonna focus on those a little bit more. First, I'm gonna talk about some of the myths, some of the things that people will tell you are obstacles, but it's just not true. Okay, one is that uh, some people will say, well, you know, women and underrepresented minorities, they, don't, they just don't aspire high enough. Study after study, and I do a lot of work um, with particularly African-American Latino youth. Um, my own area of study is adolescence. Um, study after study shows that your aspirations are as high as anybody else, and so are your parents. Um, almost, I did a study where I went out into the housing projects in New Haven and interviewed seventh graders and their parents, African Americans living in the housing projects, and there was only one family that did not mention they wanted their kids to go to college. Um, so it's not an issue of aspirations. Another thing that it's not an issue of, it's not an issue of talent. Don't let anybody tell you that the reason why there aren't women or people of color um, in the STEM disciplines, in math, is because you are not smart enough, because that's just not true. Um, one study in particular that um, I like to mention, because it, it makes that so clear that that's a falsehood, is a study that followed very highly talented women. We're talking about girls that were identified in the seventh or eighth grade by taking the PSATs at that age as in the very top one percentile in terms of talent. So the very most, in terms of math talents, quantitative skills. So the very, very most talented women. Okay, amongst that one percent in men, the majority went on to careers in STEM. Amongst women, there were more lawyers than people in the areas of STEM. So here were these very, very talented women, no question about talent and they still didn't, no, no question about talent in STEM, in quantitative science, and they still didn't go in that direction. So it's not about aspirations, and it's not about talent. So what are the issues? What are the kinds of things that research, and quite frankly, my own experience with students, tells me that are the opticals? Well, the first is that even though most young people um, regardless of socioeconomic background, quite frankly, including poor young people, they want to go to college, but they worry about, can I afford it? Can my parents afford it? You know, you don't want your parents to go, to have to, you know, go poor or your younger brother or sister to go hungry um, for you to go to college. And so the first thing I want to tell you about that, because what I want to tell you is why these shouldn't be obstacles, is that, and, and this is something that I certainly didn't know. I, I come from a more privileged background. My parents were more educated. Uh, there was no question that I was gonna go to college, but how was I gonna do it? Um, you know, it really wasn't until I filled out the equivalent of the FAFSA form years ago that I realized I qualified for every kind of financial aid on the planet because my parents made minimum wage or not much more, but nobody had told me. You know, I didn't know. In fact, my older brother started off at community college. Not that there's anything wrong with community college, but it was there. Um, he started off at community college because we thought that's what we could afford. Um, and so between working and with a lower tuition and living at home, he was able to get through his first year. And 
it was a faculty member at community college that said, you know, I think you can do better, and helped him apply to other universities. To make a long story short, he paid less to go to Duke than he was paying to go to Miami-Dade Community College, because he got a full-ride scholarship that included the cost of living. Um, I'm not telling you that everyone's going to get a package like that, but for example, at the University of Washington, um, one of the things that I was very involved in, actually when I was an executive vice provost, was developing a program that we call Husky Promise. And Husky Promise is very simple. Um, if you're an in-state citizen um, and you qualify for a Pell Grant or a state need grant, and basically, um, any family where any family of four where the income is under about fifty thousand, you pay no tuition, period, flat out. You actually often get more than that. You also you often get money to help pay for cost of living, et cetera. But the very simple message is, don't let tuition get in the way. And I really do think that you know I understand worrying about money. I grew up um, like Christina, worrying about money. My parents worried about money but there really are excellent programs out there all over the country, not at every university, but at many universities, and the UC system is quite good this way, that really make it possible for anyone, regardless of your family background, to go to college in an affordable way. And yes, you may have to take out some loans, and that may be something that is counter to everything you've grown up with. I know it was everything, but you know, you guys are smart, do the calculations, the return on investment for a college degree is just amazing. The loans are worth it, if you work hard and if you graduate. Um, then, you know, one of, the, one of the other big obstacles is that, you know, we live in a society and culture where we kind of learn that if, that you're, good, if you're good at something, it comes easy. And if it's hard, it means that maybe you're not that good. It's very interesting. There's been a number of studies conducted by one of my colleagues in Japan and China. And there, what people are taught, what young people are taught, you know, if you're not doing well, it's because you're not trying hard enough. And, you know, some math is hard. Doesn't matter how talented you are, it's hard. And so you have to get past the point that if it's not easy, if it doesn't come to you, means that you're not good at it. There are some things that are harder than others. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, because I look at these things, looking at grade inflation, et cetera, um, grades in math and engineering are amongst the lowest grades in the university. Um, first of all, the culture is that they grade harder partly because it's so much more easy when grades are quantitative than when you're you know, looking at essays. But also, like I say, it's part of the culture. So don't let, and I'll tell you my story about this later, don't let a C um, somewhere along the line mean, oh, I'm just not good enough, because that's not true. What it means is maybe you're not getting the help you need, maybe you're not working hard enough, maybe you need a tutor, et cetera, but it's not, it's not the case that if something, if something comes easy, it's probably because something is easy, not necessarily that you're so good at it. Um, the other thing that I think is um, a, a big issue, and that's why I'm so happy to see you all here today, is really the issue of role models. Um, when you grow up, you think about, you know, when you think about what you can do, you think about what you've seen. You know, the world is full of people who want to be doctors and lawyers because TV is full of doctors and lawyers. Guess what? There are other professions too. But we don't tend to see them and we don't see them in our lives. And so that's what's so good about having you all at a conference like this is look around and you see people who have done it. And you can maybe start, because you know, dreams begin in your head and you can start thinking and seeing yourself there. And that is incredibly important, and that's why we need to get those numbers up there. Because, you know, when you think, you think about what you know, and if you don't see people there, it's a problem. But it's even worse than you don't have role models. The role models you have are generally not who you want to be. The stereotypes 
of the kinds of people that go into math and science. How many of you have watched The Big Bang? How many of you want to be like that? Okay, we've got a couple. I actually am very proud to be a geek. But I'm a chic geek, okay? And geeks are beginning to get cool, and that's like, I'm with it, okay? But nonetheless, you know, there's a lot of work that shows. Uh, one of my colleagues at the University of, of, uh, of Washington has done some work where you get students, you know, college students that are invited, you know, they're invited to give tests, and then they're told, and you know, this is psychology, so none of it's true. It's an experiment. But you know, they're told at random, you're really good. We think that you, know, you have a real possibility of a career in computer science. They go into a room then to talk to someone who is theoretically a graduate student in computer science. And they see someone that's uh, very nerdy looking, and there's a poster of Spock behind them. And you know, there's you know, a big you know, pyramid made out of Coke cans. Okay, and you know, they often leave, and this is particularly the case with women, but also with Latinos and African Americans, and say, I don't know if I want to do it in computer science. This isn't, you know, me. I happen to like Spock. I'll, you know, just want to tell you that. But nonetheless, it, it's not like, you know, a real, they do the same thing, and they have someone there that's, you know, a little bit more trendy, even if it is geek trendy. Um, and there's a poster of nature. And there are, you know, bottles of water, et cetera, rather than, you know, the big Coke can. And they're much more likely to ask for information. You know, so, you know, it's a double whammy. First of all, you don't see role models that look like you. And second of all, you see role models that you don't want to be. And so that is a big obstacle um, as well. Um, another issue which um, is important is, if you really want to shine in quantitative areas, you can't start too late. It's not too late for the faces in this room, okay? But it really is very difficult um, to be a senior in college and you haven't taken you know, your calculus courses and your algebra courses, et cetera, and decide then. It's not impossible. But these are really areas where, and that's why I think it is so important, and some of the work that uh, I'm involved in is trying to get better math teachers in elementary school who can make the math more exciting and get kids more involved because, you know, it's, it's kind of like skiing. You know, I grew up in Miami, and, you know, when I went to New Haven, I remember trying on skis. And, you know, it's a lot easier to learn how to ski when you have a low center of gravity. <laughs> Enough said. Um, and so, you know, it really is, you know, it's very hard when you get too far behind. So, you know, I really urge you to start thinking about it now. It's not too late at all. Um, but the other thing, and, and I've been watching this uh, with uh, a little, how shall I say, you know, I, I, I would laugh, well, I do laugh because I don't want to cry, is that the way that people are pitching math and the way people are pitching STEM is often very counterproductive to getting folks like you into STEM. I mean, I know I read it all the time and they say, you know, go into STEM and make a lot of money. Now, I'm not saying that you're not interested in making money. I know I certainly am. And, you know, and for me, it was actually very important as it is for you. You want to make sure that you don't have the kind of safety net of, you know, your parents being able to pay things for you. So having a good lucrative career um, is certainly important. But what we find in studies of uh, particularly Latinos, African Americans, Native Americans, and also women, including white women, is that the motivation is much more about helping people, changing the world, social change, social equity, you know, helping people like you and helping the next generation, making things better for people like your parents. It's not driving a Porsche. Um, and, you know, although I'm not saying a Porsche is bad, um, I drive a Honda Civic, but what can I say, you know? Um, but, you know, that there's just, it's not being sold that way. And that's part of why that very talented group of women are more apt to go to law. Because um, with law, they think they can change the world. I can tell you, um, I am a clinical psychologist, 
And uh, I think that most of us are, in fact, um, uh, in one way or another, what pays our incomes are particularly women lawyers. I mean, no, I'm serious. You know, there are some people who have wonderful careers in law and love it, but it's not as fun. A, you know, those lawyer shows, they, there's a, they really are fiction. I mean, it is not the most, uh, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, lawyering is not anywhere near as fun and certainly not even, um, not even near as, uh, as life-changing. Um, and so, you know, I really think we need to um, start, you know, there's a couple of things I want to tell you about STEM careers that you may not be hearing from others. One, as I already told you, financial aid is there. Um, I'm, you know, don't, don't sell yourself short before you try. I think that many of you will be surprised um, at how affordable um, college can be for you. Um, the other one is that, you know, because this is one more kind of myth that I want to turn on in its head, is that, you know, one of the reasons why sometimes people don't want to go into these fields is they think it's not very social. Um, today, and that, there may have been a time, I still have, you know, when I think about a scientist, my, you know, stereotype of here is, you know, someone in a garret working alone, you know, with a computer, you know, all day and all night, you know, writing code or whatever. Um, but the truth is that, you know, nowadays, um, you know, most of the easy problems that could be solved by one person sitting by themselves in a lab have been solved. Um, most of the really difficult issues are multidisciplinary ones that require teams of people working together. And so a career in STEM, including computer science, including math, et cetera, yes, you'll spend some time by yourself, but you will be working in groups. It can be a social career. It can be fun. Um, and that's really important to remember. And then again, you don't have to be a geek. Although if you are and you're proud of it, that's fine too. But all kinds of people go into these fields. You know, you don't have to be like Sheldon. Um, you actually can have some social skills. Um, you can date. Um, you can, you know, get married and all those kinds of things and still be a computer science or a mathematician. As a matter of fact, they're kind of sexy if you think about it. <laughs> That's been my experience in any case. Um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe the most important thing is that your work can be meaningful. Um, it can be world changing. It has been world changing. Technology is changing the world. It is, if you look around particularly at quote unquote third world countries, um, the middle class, there's the beginnings of a middle class largely because of technology. In this country, it's leading to a lot of inequity. So that's a different story. Um, but it really can be life-changing. Um, and the other thing is that even if you don't go, I mean, these, these days, career is not a destination. It's a journey. Um, I think most of us, I think we got that from Christina, loud and clear, you know, who tried this and tried that and thought she was going to do this and you know the dinosaurs you know maybe you'll still get a chance to dig those up they've got these adult programs where you can go and work with an archaeologist i know someone you can dig some bones with because um, you know hey i bet you'd be good at it but you know we do that i mean i started off as a journalism major um, and you know i made my way all kinds of ways and um, finally, you know, when I finally decided I was going to be a clinical psychologist and I told my mother, um, very sophisticated in the ways of mental health, she said, why would you want to work with crazy people? <laughs> now, I, I didn't have a comeback then, but I do now, which is we all work with crazy people. <laughs> but when you're a clinical psychologist, they know it and they want to change. <laughs> Enough said. Um, and so, but, but really, um, in all of these areas that often tend to attract um, particularly people of color, sociology, psychology, areas, social work, areas where you think you can help people, they've become much more quantitative. I could not do my job anywhere near as well. Um, I don't do math modeling, um, but without being able to read a spreadsheet, without being able to do regressions, without being able to understand statistics, um, and so that even in terms of the humanities, we've, you know, one of the new areas that's growing is the digital humanities. 
Um, and so no matter what you want to do, and whatever you think you want to do now, it'll probably change, and then it might change back, like I say. But having really strong quantitative skills will help. Um, my mother always used to tell me, keep doors open until you have to close them. Okay, when you get a rigorous math education as a high school student, as a college student, you are opening doors. You may end up deciding to go into that door instead of that one. But if you don't do those things, you're closing doors really prematurely. And you shouldn't be, you know, like I say, it really is about keeping the doors open, especially at your age, so that STEM isn't just, and, and I'm really focusing particularly on the math and quantitative skills. You know, it isn't just about becoming a mathematician or a computer scientist or a statistician, although those are fabulous careers. I want to be very clear about that. Um, but it really is about having a very meaningful career. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and, you know, and Q&A if you want to know more. Hey, my life's an open book. Um, I'm, you know, the typical immigrant, came to this country when I was three. Um, my parents were Cuban, um, fleeing a socialist revolution. Um, I did have, my mom didn't go to college, but my father did. In fact, he was minister of education in Cuba at the time, so we had to get out quick. Um, I was three, they just took me. I didn't, you know, we can talk about my politics some other time. Um, but uh, in any case, so, he was, like I say, I was privileged in the fact of there was absolutely no question that I would go to college. But in this country, you know, my dad did everything from sweeping floors. Um, for most of the time that I was growing up, my mom was working in a factory making tennis shoes, and she had never worked before. And my father worked in a factory making dress shoes, pretty much at minimum wage. So the whole issue of how we were going to get there um, was really the, the, the biggest issue. Um, but also the other thing, at least for me, was that um, I didn't have one of those inspirational math teachers or, or science teachers, quite frankly, in high school. Um, the stuff that, you know, I, you know, I loved reading and literature and history and basically anything but. Um, I just, you know, I took the courses, I took calculus, I, you know, I did it all because I wanted to be ready for college, but, you know, they weren't particularly inspiring. And that is why I really think it's important to have, there are ways to teach math and science that are much more inspiring. Um, so when I went to college, it was like, you know, um, I never want to take a math course again. I knew I had to take, and I, and I, and I managed to, you know, actually test out of beginning math because I had done the calculus and whatever. Um, in high school, and I think I took human biology. You know, like I say, you know, as far away from anything, you know, certainly wasn't going to take a physics course, be, course again. Um, and like I say, I wanted to be a journalist. This was in the days of Wood, Wood, uh, Woodward and Bernstein. Sometimes I can talk English, and sometimes I can. I get nervous when I'm up here. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was going to change the world because journalism changed the world, that, you know, outed a corrupt president and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But what I found was that it didn't really match with what I liked. You know, I, I love the idea of interviewing people and working with people. And I want to be clear, I think that tough journalism is very important. But I wasn't, it wasn't fun for me to stick a microphone in someone's mouth and kind of play gotcha, you know, which is what you do with investigative journalism. Someone needs to do it, but it wasn't me. Um, but I started realizing that I really liked working with people. I took my first psychology class, you know, I, and I decided this was my career. Um, had to take statistics, did fine there, went to graduate school, and this is, a, this is the end, I'll just tell one snippet of a story. Um, when I went to graduate school, I actually got a scholarship to go to Yale. I did my undergraduate work at home, I was a commuter student. Good Cuban girls did not leave home until they were married. That's another story we can talk about. Um, but in any case, uh, so all of a sudden, I have to take a statistics class. I had, quite frankly, the most uninspiring professor on the planet. Um, he was someone that was a year from retiring um, and should have retired at least the year before. And all his examples were about, he did, you know, work with animals. 
And you know, that's important work, but all his examples, I could not see it. As at Yale, they don't actually give A, B, and C because everyone's above average. Um, they give, you know, they give honors, high pass, and pass. And pass is not really pass. Pass is a C. Um, and so this, uh, this, I thought I had done okay in the stats class. I, I have to say, like, I didn't. I tried to work hard, but it was it was hard to motivate myself. Um, well, as it turned out, I was very, very lucky that this guy who was so uninspiring also wasn't inspired enough to turn in grades. Because if, I, if he had turned them in at the end of the quarter, I would have been on probation. I did get a pass in my stats class. Um, but by the time he turned them in, I'd taken my second stats class. And in that class, what they had us do, and at the time I was doing a, a project focusing on uh, minority youth and families, and in fact, uh, motivation for uh, uh, motivation related to doing well in school. This was at the high school level. And I had a data set that I was, you know, trying to make sense of. And the way he taught this class was he gave us this data set, and the project at the end of the year was to do something with the data. And so as I was learning techniques like multiple regression, et cetera, I had an end product in mind. It was going to help me understand something that I wanted to understand. It was something relevant. Well, by the time that the past grade was turned in, I'd gotten an honors in statistics. And it wasn't that I became smarter overnight. It was that I cared. And when you care, you work hard. And when you work hard, you succeed. And with that, I will end. Thank you. So you can do it. Okay, so now um, it's the, an opportunity for people to ask questions of our uh, two uh, panelists here. So I really want to encourage you to step up front and ask for you. Hello, my question is for Dr. Kase. So you, I don't earlier, is fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were talking about how talent is not an obstacle, and I know some people who are extremely underestimated, whose abilities are underestimated because of their ethnic background. Well, what happens when it's in reverse? So I'm Asian, so people say, oh, you're Asian, so you gotta be really smart. And quite frankly, I don't think I'm all that smart. So, I mean, I mean it can be, I mean, deep-seated self-confidence issues. But um, I was just thinking, like, well, how do you get out of that slump if you feel like people are expecting you to be someone you're not? Yeah, no, I think that, you know, there's the whole, you know, stereotypes cut both ways. And the whole model minority stereotypes that, you know, I mean, you know, you were born with equations in your head and, you know, guess what? I mean, some people are, but doesn't vary that much by ethnicity. And I do think that that can be an issue because if you, it can really be a problem. If people expect you to fail, you know, that's not good. But if people are expecting you to be up here and, you know, you're falling short, it can do things to your, to your self-esteem. Um, and also, I think that we see um, Asian Americans and Asians underrepresented in some areas, like the arts and like the humanities, et cetera, because the other part of the stereotype is that you're not very good in that. Um, you know, I don't have, you know, I wish I had an answer um, to that, but I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of these things, it's important to have people you can talk to about it, um, friends. Um, you know, if the, if the professor is treating you differently, um, if the teacher is treating you differently, you might want to have a talk, um, you know, afterwards. And, you know, um, but I, ah, someone have an answer for her? What I would probably just say is, I mean, you've got to be yourself, right? You've got to feel comfortable with yourself, because regardless of what other people say, um, and even like Ana Maria mentioned, you know, talk to others, right? Talk to your friends, um, your peers, your parents, you know, can always help. 
But um, you've got to feel very comfortable just with yourself, regardless of what others say. And I know, I mean, I've heard you know negative remarks too, and sometimes it gets me down. But I know I have to pick up myself. And right? I said, this is, I mean, this person just doesn't know me, right? So I think you, I mean, you've got to feel comfortable, and then you know, go forward and 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 just know that you're trying, you know, you're doing your best, and this is the career you want to uh, pursue. Yeah, see, I mean, you know, mathematicians can do psychology. Psychology doesn't necessarily do math, so <laughs> that's why you want a career in math. No, I mean, but seriously, I, I'm a lot like you. I mean, sometimes the more people tell me I can't, the more I'm determined to prove them wrong, you know, just because I'm ornery. <laughs> so, uh, next question. Come on, don't be shy. It's your opportunity. Don't all talk at once. Yes. Uh, who's that? Coming up? Okay. Go for it. This question is for Christina. So we chatted a bit yesterday and you mentioned that you kind of stayed in Texas because I was like home to you and you felt really comfortable and that's why you went into academia. So how did you get out of your comfort zone and pursue so many, like like take initiative to pursue so many opportunities? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, yeah, so right, I stayed in Texas after I you know, got my PhD. I still got jobs in Texas, um, not necessarily wanting to stay there, but um, I just happened to get them there, right? Um, but, uh, you know, one thing I, I, I one of my slides mentioned um, taking a step at a time, and I didn't get a chance to talk about that, so I'm glad you, you raised that is um, issue. So throughout my career, you know, from high school to where I am now, I've always just taken it a step at a time, right? I, I cannot look ahead 10 years from now, I'm not too sure, but I can have an idea of how to plan ahead. Right, and, uh, but it's always just been a step at a time. I wanted to become a secretary, and I said, you know, maybe that's not it. So I tried different jobs, right? And I just thought, maybe that's not for me. Maybe I should go to college, and I wanted to become a math teacher, and then I thought, maybe I should go a little bit further than that and go to graduate school. And um, so it's always just been a step at a time, and I've had great mentors. So I know, you know, Ana Maria also talked about the mentors. Um, and you, know, you, you find a lot of Latino faculty here, you know, and, and you know, faculty of all colors who care about you know, these types of underrepresented, underrepresented issues right, for women and minorities um, in the STEM fields. And so you know, reach out to these folks and, and ask questions, right? And um, I mean, this is the first Latino conference where you know, 2015, we should have had this many years ago. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll have one, you know, another one soon. But um, you know, the issue is it's just taking a step at a time. Right, uh, you know, right now I mentioned this new appointment that I have. It's like it's a department head for, it's like the head of a department, and I'm responsible for 50 faculty plus some others. Um, and again, it was just a step at a time. And I just thought, there's no way I'm going to do this. You know, I've got kids; they're 10 and 12 years old, and how am I going to balance this? And and actually, since it's an interim position, I I'm viewing it as the opportunity to balance what I can right now so that if I cannot balance very well, then I know I have to wait later to you know, seek another administrative position. So this is like a test, a test for me also. And I'm really trying to balance things. So far, I think I'm doing pretty well. And I hope my husband does think so also. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's just taking it a step at a time, right? And uh, you cannot overwhelm yourself too much. Uh, but you just take it a step at a time and you know, I wonder, you know, this is a challenge and let me get, you know, get that challenge. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that. I mean, there's no way that even, quite frankly, a year ago, um, you would have told me that I'd be, you know, heading up a university with an almost $6 billion budget and 50,000 students and 40,000 employees. Um, and, you know, how would I ever thought that I could do that? And partly it's that you're surrounded by other people who help you. And, but you don't know that. You just look at this person and say, how do they know that? Um, most things really are team efforts, and I think that you just go, can you do that next step? And if it fits and you do okay, then guess what? Another step comes after that, and all of a sudden you're someplace and you say, you know, there, there's that talking headstone, and how did I get here? Um, and, you know, it really is, and, and it's not clear. Um, and I, I really, I mean, I do think it's important to plan. Um, one of my, you're, you guys are probably too young to remember Lily Tomlin, but she was a, a comedian who, you know, played a bag lady, and you know, she's walking around with a shopping cart, and she says, you know, gee, um, I always wanted to be somebody. In retrospect, I should have been more specific. <laughs> okay, so no, it, it, it's important to have plans and to know where you want to go, but you also then have to be up 
open to opportunities that take you places you never thought you were going to go. And step at a time, you end up, oh my god, how did I get here? Um, and uh, it's kind of cool. That's right. Next one. Hello. First, I would like to thank you guys for being here. It's talking to all of us. Um, this question is for, um, actually, I can address it to all three of you. Um, uh, but the two panelists here, the two that spoke, you guys talked to us about uh, the, your past to where you are now. And I'm curious about your future goals and then also your dreams and hopes for the next generation and future generations. Okay, Nori, what do you do after being brother? Um, you become brother? Retire. Become brother. <laughs> retire. Uh, you know, I think that the way that I kind of really look at things is I, I think less about where I want to go in terms of position than what is it that I want to do. Um, and I think probably like many of you, um, you want to make the world better, um, especially for people like you um, dealing with issues around social justice. Um, I'm one of the things that I'm going to be doing next week. And um, it's, it's, it, it's a little scary because it's risky. I'm going to um, launch a race initiative, race and ethnicity initiative at our university. And I'm going to talk about it. And talking about race is not easy. And uh, part of what I want to talk about uh, is that it's not about a few bad apples. Um, like some people look at it, there's these bigots, let's take them out and then the world's a fine place, but it's about all of us. And I want to talk about institutional racism um, because I, this is very important to me. And I have the bully pulpit, so I'm going to use it. And, you know, and so that's what I want to do. If it means I get the job later on, fine. And if it means I don't get the job, I don't want the job if I can't do that. Um, and so, you know, it really is more about what are the things that uh, you really want to do. Um, one of the things that uh, will be announced sometime later on my campus is that, um, in, in, uh, and it's not announced yet, but uh, is that, uh, maybe it is, and it happened while I was gone, but um, one of the things that I'm very proud of is uh, Seattle is moving to a $15 minimum wage, and the university doesn't have to comply with it. And we did announce last week that for all our, quote, regular employees, non-student employees, we were going to all go to 11, which is the first step towards going to 15. And so, of course, I got criticized and, you know, lots of marches and rallies about not having students there. The reason why we didn't have students there is, guess what? Um, our student government had to go through a vote, et cetera, et cetera. And I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't going to say everyone but the student government is going to go to 11. And so I knew we were going to go there. Um, if they had said no, we would have gone there. But I wasn't going to do that to them. And so they voted on it uh, yesterday. And we're going to be able to say that all our student employees are going to $11 an hour. That's really, that's something, that's a decision that I can make as university president. And that makes this position worthwhile. Um, I can make decisions like that. But it's not about the position. It's about what you can do. Right. Yeah, and I completely agree with Anna Maria. I was, you know, agreeing with her throughout, throughout your, uh, your your speech right now. Um, right. So as as department head uh, or you know interim director, um, I'm also you know making decisions of this form. So I mentioned my campus right now. Um, you know, two campuses has about 50 faculty, a PhD faculty, uh, three are Latinos and five are women. Right. I mean, so these are despicable numbers. And, um, and so what I want to do is increase the number of Latino faculty uh, for the fall and also the number of women, right? And so that's a decision that I can make. I had, you know, one committee said, you know, what about these names? I said, mm, I don't agree with some of these and, and, you know, look at some other ones. So um, so those are the type of decisions that I can make now as, as you know, chair of, uh, or interim director of this uh, school. And, um, and so you can make change in that manner. Right before when I, I mean, and I'm still a faculty member, but when I was just a faculty member, it was, it was really tough because I didn't have that decision making ability. But when you get into these positions, you really have some power in the sense of making decisions. And if you can make, you know, great decisions or make positive decisions, that's really where you can make an impact. So, um, you know, um, Kofi Annan, when I was in, uh, so he was a, a UN secretary many years ago. Uh, when I was at graduate school, he gave a talk at Rice. And, um, and he mentioned how, you know, folks with good intentions should go into politics, 
right, and take these positions because you are the ones who have good intentions, who want to make positive changes, but sometimes we get politicians with, you know, we all complain about politicians, right? Because they've got their own agendas and, you know, their favoritism and so forth, and those are the folks making decisions when there are, in fact, honest people like, you know, you in the audience who can make positive changes, and those are the folks that we need in decision-making uh, positions. So, you know, if you're given that opportunity to be in an administrative position, look at it as something positive, you can have a lot of positive impact. Yeah, if I can just add to that, one of the things that sometimes happens with folks that aren't in the mainstream but have experienced oppression, racism, et cetera, is that they develop what in my field we call reactive identities. So that doing well becomes acting white. Um, and, you know, um, being in a position of authority means being a, begins with an A and ends with an E and a couple of S's in the middle. Um, and, you know, and, and, and we tend to, you know, short, shortchange ourselves that way. Um, and we tend to see those folks as actually the enemy rather than as someone that you want to be. I, I like to joke, but it's not that much of a joke that if I ever write my memoirs, it'll be my life as an administrator, how I became a straight white man. Because <laughs> I'm not any of those. Um, and, you know, because, and, and people then stereotype you in a, different, in a different position, but quite frankly, if it's not people like us, you know, you can either be at the table or you can be lunch. You decide. There you go. That's great advice. Please. Go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for coming out here and uh, giving us some of your time. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'm I'm a part of a, a national organization called Mayas Latinos in Science and Engineering, and one of the main goals is to increase numbers of Latinos in the STEM fields. And um, you know, from, from bringing them in, you know, getting them interested and retaining them in college, which is a huge problem we have, and also, you know, the transition out of uh, university. And I guess the a question I, I wanted to ask was, um, how can we have Latinos, how can we reach out to other Latinos so we can help one another? Because a big problem is that uh, a lot of times we're prideful and, you know, we're not afraid to ask for help, but we're just very reluctant. And how, you know, how can we, encourage others to ask for help and reach out to, to them. So support networks, what can you say about those? Well, I think actually there's a, there, there is good research that particularly in adolescence, um, when it comes to anything, um, and it's part of developing you know, that identity that you can and that you're an adult is, it's a, very, it's a time when people don't ask for help about much of anything. And I think partly it's a question of reframing it. And I honestly think that asking for help is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. Because when you ask for help, you're making yourself vulnerable. And the, the choice to make yourself vulnerable really means having some kind of inner strength. Um, I think that sometimes it's a lot easier to start with your peers, and that's where peer support groups or people, I mean, it's one of the reasons why role models are good, because you can talk to people that you might feel more comfortable with, and that's often the first step. But I really think a lot of it is about that reframe um, that, and if you, know, if you don't ask for something, sometimes people don't ask for something because they're afraid they're not gonna get it. Well, if you don't ask for it, you're guaranteed of not getting it. And if you ask for it, maybe sometimes you won't, but it's the only way that you might. Right, and I think for the Latino population, I mean, studies have shown that um, you know, when students study together, they tend to do better, right? And so I learned that as an undergraduate when I was at UT Austin. There were very few Latinos, um, you know, from the Valley. I was probably the only one, for, you know, studying mathematics. And, um, and so I got together with groups of students, and we studied. We studied together. Um, so that was very powerful, right? And, um, and I have mentioned, you know, through the talk, you've got to take the initiative. Um, I was just taught, don't be shy, right? And like Ana Marie said, I mean, you're, it's, yeah, sure, you're opening up yourself. You're vulnerable when you ask for help. Um, I've just, I've never, I, I guess you can think of it as help. I just think I gotta have a question answered, you know, and I need, a, I need advice. I need, you know, uh, advice in which direction to head. Um, and that's really the way I think of it. Yeah. Um, so, but I think studying together is probably a good idea. And I usually tell students, um, you know, if you study together, it doesn't have to be with another Latino, it can be with anyone, but make sure that whoever you, you know, whatever study group you form, the individuals in the group are not so high, you know, advanced above you and, and not too much below you either. And you need somebody who's average and slightly higher than that so that you can bounce off questions, right, and really learn, you know, learn material. 
Yeah, I want to add one more thing because if you were talking, it, it, it came to me. Is also think about when you're going to ask for help. You know, for example, all college professors have office hours. Okay, if you go to the office hour the day before the exam, guess what? They're going to be swamped. They're not going to have time for you. And you know, you'll get something, but it won't be that much. But I can tell you at the end of the first day of class, you know, two weeks before the exam, it's like the Maytag repairman. You know, nobody comes and it's so exciting when they do. And when they come, and when you do ask help of a professor, you know, don't just start with, well, what's the answer to this? or what kind of questions are you going to ask? Because you know what, that's, it's not exciting to me to know that the only reason why you're there is because you want to know what's on the exam. Say, you know, I'm really interested in this and I really didn't understand that. And you know, hey, I love to explain, you know, stuff that I'm teaching about. And so think about how you ask for help as well, because sometimes we inadvertently can ask for help in a way that can kind of be a turnoff. That's very good, thanks. <laughs> Uh, first off, I'd like to say that I'm extremely inspired by all the work that you guys are doing. Um, I think it really motivates most of us that are junior faculty to really, you know, reach back and try to help also, you know, younger uh, students. One thing that I'd like to hear your thoughts and comments on is I feel like I struggle a lot with the imposter syndrome still. Uh, you know, trying to advance my career and make the right choices for the, the goals that I set for myself. Um, but how do I overcome that? Because I still think it's quite present in myself and other junior faculty that I speak to. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I you know, there's there's two different ways to talk about an interim president. One is interim president. One is acting president. Whatever you call it, I'm acting like a president. <laughs> and you know, I, you know, it's like it's why I'm more comfortable being called an Amati president, Kelsey. And I'm like, who the hell is that? Um, you know, I, I, maybe someone overcomes it. I certainly haven't. Um, but I'm, you know, but it doesn't stop me from doing what I need to do, and and it's partly because of those stereotypes. And I'm not that person. I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe when I'm 70, all of a sudden it's like, oh, guess I'm that person. You know. I, but I, I wish I could tell you it's going to stop. It hasn't stopped for me, but it also hasn't stopped me. Oh, I just would like to hear some questions from the high school students who are visiting us. High school students? Yes. Any questions? Okay, now I've gotten to the point where I can't tell. Even even junior faculties look like high school students yeah, to me. High school students. So, so who are the high school students? <laughs> okay, just raise your hand if you're a high school student. Okay, you, come up here and ask a question. <laughs> You can do it, the woman in, you know, black and white. <laughs> Not that I'm putting you on the spot or anything. Come on, just clap for her because she's willing to do it. Are you scared? Yeah. I was scared when I was up there, too. This is tape, so don't be scared. <laughs> I guess, uh, what was like your biggest ex inspiration for you to start with your journey? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, my biggest inspiration. You know, this is, uh, I mean, I would say my mother, right? Uh, so my mom, you know, I mean, since I was a kid, right? So, so my mom, you know, just inspired me. Um, she, you know, pushed us to the best, and uh, I mean, in open houses, and I don't know if schools have open houses anymore, but back then we used to have open houses. Um, yeah, you know, my parents always showed up, and, and I mean, I was, you know, doing well in school, right? But my mom was the one who really, you know, always pushed me. And, uh, you know, and I had mentioned here, she told, you know, she mentioned, you know, you're a woman, and if you ever get married one day, I asked, you know, try and get a job, because if something should, negative happen, right, you can, uh, you know, you still have a career to fall back on and you can get out of a situation because you have a career. So, um, you know, so I remember, you know, these talks and, and she still tells me, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm married to a wonderful husband, I've got two kids, and, um, but my mom was the one who really inspired me quite a lot, just to go ahead and, and as I mentioned, to ask for opportunities, right, go find them, Some, you know, Opportunities may not always knock there, but you just go find them and, and you'll find out that they are there, right? And not so many, you know, not too many people ask sometimes, so you're at, you know, at an advantage when you seek them out. 
Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that happens with life is that you actually remake your life story um, over time. And I think if I were to be asked now, I'd probably say my parents. But I think that what, you know, got me to think about graduate school and about psychology was really a couple of was well, one was a professor and one was a graduate student. And the professor was actually an African-African professor. He was from Nigeria. And uh, I was taking an honors class in psychology. And he just, he told me, it's the first person who really, you know, outside of high school who really told me I asked good questions and I was smart. Um, and, you know, and he was the one who suggested that I, um, I had a work study and there was a work study position that was being a research assistant, something that I never thought about. And so he was huge. But then the second person that was really huge was um, the lab I ended up working on. There was um, a young man who was Latino, um, who was a graduate student, and who kind of took me under his wing. Um, he was the only Latino that I had seen in, in psychology, because psychology isn't necessarily a field that we grow up in, because it's not something that a lot of, you know, we don't, you know, mental health isn't a big deal in our culture. And I, I can talk about why it should be, but that's another talk. Um, and so, and I think he really did. Um, and he was uh, part of this program called the American Psychological Association Minority Fellowship Program. And uh, the director of that program visited all the fellows. And when he came to University of Miami to visit him, Javier made sure that I met with him. And I think that that was, you know, the first time, I, you know, that I really thought, I had been thinking about a master's in social work, nothing wrong with that, but it was the first time I thought about, hey, I should think about a PhD. I think we have time for one final question. And thank you for asking. <laughs> See, you, you can do it. Was that, was, that, was that really so hard? No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I, I just wanted to thank you for imparting all of your wisdom. Um, I know everyone here is appreciative, and it's so great to see all of these high school students. I'm really excited about that. Um, but my question was actually related to uh, you know just being a Latino in, in mathematics, and um, you know, and this is I think pertinent to know you know no matter what stage of your career you are, whether you're in high school and you're an undergrad or you're junior faculty or um, in, in a faculty position, how sort of the perception that uh, perhaps your success or your presence, you know, where you are, um, was, you know, maybe due to, is somewhat undermined maybe, or questioned because of a perception that you were given some kind of concession um, because you're Latino. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're happy to take opportunities, but how do we deal with um, accepting opportunities, but then at the same time not having them perceived by the larger mathematical community as some kind of, uh, you know, giveaway that might ultimately uh, be deleterious in some sense to our career, uh, you know, or, and with, or to our perception among others in the community. That's a tr tricky question. Let's see. Yeah. Well, I remember um, when I was a graduate student, um, there was an undergraduate from, and I remember, from Cornell. I don't remember the student's name, though, but he was from the Valley, and he came to Rice, um, you know, one summer, because he was mentoring. He was in some summer program at Rice, and I was a graduate student. And so this, again, the student was from Cornell, uh, Latino, and um, and so he meant, you know, he talked a little bit about this, and he said that, um, you know, he, he would get questions like this, you know, affirmative action helped you get in, right, into Cornell and so forth. And so he responded and said, um, you know, that might have gotten me into college, but it's not keeping me in college, right? And so I thought, oh, wow, those are powerful words. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I just wanted to share that with you because, you know, there are perhaps some programs, right, that allow uh, women and underrepresented minorities to get into certain, you know, programs, but it's your determination and work that's keeping you, you know, in, and, you, you know, and so you were given this opportunity, and so now you've got to complete that task, and in this case, you know, get the degree, and so forth. Um, right now in the position that I'm in, I don't see it so much as, you know, having been chosen, you know, because I'm a woman and an underrepresented minority um, for this uh, department head position. I just see it, I, I've always, and then I was just appointed, so let me go back. I've just been, you know, in this position for a month, 
right? And <laughs> so not too long. Um, but um, I've, I've just, you know, from the get, you know, the get go, I just figured I've, I'm qualified for this, and I applied, and there were others, and you know what, I can make some positive changes now that I'm in this position, um, and that's really the way I've, I've been seeing things. And that is not to say that I haven't questioned myself in the past. Sure, I have, right? But like I, you know, we we talked with another um, uh, student who asked this question. Um, you know, you move forward, and you go great. I was given, you know, perhaps I got in because of this. And now I need to take advantage of it as, you know, show the world or show myself that I can accomplish it, right? And so I, I've never really thought of it as anything negative, but, you know, you go forward and, and you do your best, right? And then you, you wait for that next opportunity. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't just happen in, in mathematics. I, I remember my advisor uh, or one of my advisors in college um, and, you know, a white guy. And he kind of said, you know, I wish that I could be your agent and this was football because everyone's going to want you. And it was clear that everyone was going to want me, not because I was smart, but because I was a woman and I was a minority, not like him who had to work for it. Um, and, you know, and, and that happens. And I was kind of devastated by it because um, this was, you know, one of my advisors. I actually changed advisors after that. Um, but, you know, and, and that was a luxury that I could. And my, my, the advisor I got my dissertation under was African American and would have never done something like that. Um, but it was kind of devastating at the moment. But you know, think about it, okay? Think about the advantages that, um, you know, I went to Yale, okay? Um, during, you know, Thanksgiving, all these people came back with skiing tans. You know, in many cases, they had family after, you know, one of my friends in, in graduate school, her great-grandfather had a building named after him in campus. Now, who do you think had more advantages and got more of a push forward, her or me? Um, you know, I mean, and she's not running around saying, oh, I just got in because, you know. Um, you know, I think exactly what Christina said. You know, we all get places um, for different kinds of reasons. And I can assure you, I mean, I'm getting a little bit of that now. Um, we've never had a woman president of the university. And so, you know, there's some, you know, there's some folks that, well, you know, maybe you got it because it was, a, and I said, you know, look, we've had, you know, 20 presidents, they've all been men. You don't think they got it because they were men? You don't think that, you know, it's like, come on. And so just reason your way through it. Reason your way through it. And, you know, I mean, really don't think about what they've said. Reason your way through it. Doesn't make any sense. I think that's great. That's very good advice. Yeah. So I think we're going to uh, wrap it up because uh, it's uh, lunchtime. But first, um, Federico Arguida is going to say a few things. But let's thank the panelists for their wonderful <laughs> <all> <laughs>